If you sit down. Where, where do you want me coming in from? Later. First decade of hip hop. Scene one, take 19. My name is Dean Rodland. I'm. What was I going to say? Oh. Keep going. No. oh, sorry, I just did that. Hi, I'm Dean Rudland, and for the last 30 years, I've been compiling albums. <laughs> uh, yo! Oh no! And I was thinking, Mummy's going out for a walk. What about you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Dean Rudland and I have been curating compilation albums for all of my adult life. Um, I have a deep passion for the history of um, black American music, particularly from the 60s through to the 80s. My new project and latest project is Dollar Bill Yule, the first decade of hip hop. A look at what Spring Records did from when they released the first hip hop record in 1979 with the Fatback Band's um, King Tim 3 through to when they closed their doors a decade later and that labels strange and inconsistent relationship with the hip hop band. New York in the 1970s is a place of legend. It's a place, it was a city that was falling apart with uh, a declared bankrupt midway through the decade, political corruption, murders, poverty, the Bronx burning as um, rogue landlords took insurance money insurance money by burning down buildings rather than um rather than fixing up and taking the rent it was a city that might never have come back and with all cities like that interesting art so you had things like you you had the factory and warhol uh downtown uptown you had african-american and latino kids coming up with music and ways of entertaining themselves that existed at the margins. Hip hop as a music itself developed out of a hip hop culture of graffiti, dances played by DJs, all stemming from the uh, 1973 passes that uh, an expat Jamaican called Cool Herc threw at the Sedgwick's buildings in the Bronx. Herc developed a a way of playing where he noticed that the dancers were dancing to a particular part of a record. They, the, the record would reach a point and that point would be the greatest moment of engagement with the dance floor. And he got to thinking, he thought, why don't I just play that part? You know, the drum break from um, Bongolia or um, Bongo Rock by, uh, the, by or, or Apache or, um, you know, the the organ from Champ or hundreds of things, you know, the breakdown in It's Just Begun. These things created a party scene and other people copied him. And you've got people like Africa Van Barter with the Zulu Nation, um, Grandmaster Flash, working on these things, coming up with ways of putting the music together in the, um, in the uh, halls, clubs, and um, often in um, street parties, you know, block parties that would go on in the hot summers in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and, and in Harlem. These these events could uh, could get thousands of people at, at at some points, and it made people who were in the music industry in New York start to think, how could I? How can I make this happen? And there was a number of people who were trying to work out a way. Um, one of those was Bill Curtis, who was the leader of the Fatback Band, who were massively successful throughout the 70s, both in the UK and in their home country, almost uniquely with a different set of records in the UK that were popular than were the ones that were popular in the US. Bill Curtis was a fascinating person who had, who had been demobbed in 1950, had come north, um, played in touring bands, including with the likes of Jimmy Reed, played in the Apollo House Band in Harlem. Um, in the early 70s had had his uh, storefront booking agency where he's called Fatback's House of Hits where he would have, uh, he had a record label, he booked the band out to 
do weddings and bar mitzvahs and anything else to make money. He understood the street. Um, he'd had some great records, but he also was connected with a, a New York industry of people like Paul Winley, who'd recorded doo-wop records and was recording funk records as the 70s started. Sylvia and uh, Bobby Robinson, who were out in New Jersey with their all platinum label. Um, people who kind of had always worked, and Bobby Robinson up in Harlem with his uh, um, Bobby's House of Hits uh, record store that had was the one, the record store that was next to on the same same block as uh, the Apollo, where you know the, all of these people knew what was going on on the street, how black music was developing, and all of them were looking for ways of taking the music forward. Uh, and exploiting whatever trends were coming through. For instance, Jimmy Spicer's Money Dollar Bill Yule is one of the cl early classics of hip hop, but it was recorded after a three year gap. It brings in many of the most interesting people of early hip hop um, music industry. Uh, Spicer himself was managed by Russell Simmons, Rush Management. He was one of their first clients along with Curtis Blow. Simmons, of course, went on to uh, start up Def Jam and be, be one of the most important entrepreneurs in the whole history of hip hop. Dollar Bill itself is a brilliant electronic uh, based um, hip hop number that has been sampled many times including by Montel Jordan on This Is How We Do It and of course the Wu-Tang Clan on uh, Cream. Um, other records on here include DJ Hollywood who um, was one of the early pioneers of hip hop talking. He was kind of more uptown, he did it in the clubs, he wasn't really a street rapper but he made very interesting records. Magic's Message was made by um, the New York radio DJ Mr. Magic who had a uh, who had the groundbreaking show on WBLS um, KISS in New York City, which uh, was the main, the main show for hip hop. In fact, it, when it started, it was the only show um, where he worked alongside Marley Marl, who of course became a world famous rapper in his own right later on. Spring Records have been going since the uh, late 60s and had been had an association with Polydor Records throughout the 1970s, which had meant that every album released was heavily funded. Um, this meant this created a great atmosphere for their main acts: the Fatback Band, Millie Jackson, and Joe Simon. They were given money to make a record once, maybe twice a year, and they were then promoted through Polydor's systems, which created some massive hits for all three acts. Bill Curtis particularly was keen to always keep on top of what was going on and alongside his partner in crime Jerry Thomas they were keen to keep the band moving forward. You'd see this in the 1980s when they made a whole album of electronic music um, with the This Is The Future album but in 1978-79 they noticed hip-hop was really working in the New York clubs and they thought, what could we do to make a record? So they had a tr they had an instrumental called Catch That Beat, and someone suggested um, they, that they knew a rapper who could come in and record. A friend suggested a, a, a rapper called Tim Washington to come up to the studio. He insisted on being called King Tim Three, rapping over the Catch a Beat track. He created what was to be the first recorded evidence of rap music, despite some claims by several other people that they were first. Bill tried to convince the powers that be at Spring that this should be their next single. They were frightened that something so raw would upset their supporters at R&B Radio. So they sneaked the track out on the B-side of Fat Fat Band's next single. Within a month, Bill's old friend uh, Jer uh, Joe Robinson at Sugar Hill Sugar Hill Platinum have put out the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, which became a worldwide smash and was generally seen as the first hip hop record. But it wasn't. However, what this showed was Spring Record's attitude to hip hop and rap music over the next decade. A strange, uneasy relationship where they dealt with it but didn't really champion it. So, how do we put something like this together? The, the truth of the matter is, 
all compilations start with an idea and a story we want to tell. And it's this one was specifically designed to tell the story of how Spring Records adapted to the changing world from the soul and funk that they had known in the 1970s and been successful in. It's a story that has come across almost every specialist indie label in the history of the music industry. And to be honest, most fail at it. Spring absolutely failed at it. It didn't, it didn't continue their success and the label lost their biggest acts in this decade. However, as with almost all other indie labels during these periods, they do end up making incredible records because th the only way they can survive at this is to throw their doors open to people who have a lot of talent but can't get chosen elsewhere. So we go and look at what, first of all, we go and look at what they released in that period. Obviously, with Spring, there's the story of the Fatback Band releasing the first ever hip-hop record. But what happened afterwards? They didn't make a star of King Tim 3, so w why not? We, we need to answer that. Why did it take him another three years to record Jimmy Spicer? How did he end up there? Why did all these things exist in their catalogue throughout that decade? Once you've answered that, you then have to look at how you put this together. Again, with Spring, it's quite an easy story. They start at the beginning with hip hop bands that played live, or hip hop that was recorded with live bands. And in fact, most of the live bands were kind of thrown together house bands. There's certainly, certainly someone like Bobby Robinson or Enjoy or um, Paul Winley, they weren't, they weren't pulling together the best bands in the country to do this. Fatback Band were one of the best, most tight funk bands in the country. So you get an incredible performance, but, after that, what happens? You can see the beginning of electronic sampling, you can see the use of drum machines on Jimmy Spicer, uh, the Bally Boys, which is an incredibly rare record now, so rare that it's been bootlegged um, in 2019 on a 12-inch. Um, that shows the early days of kind of classic era, golden age era hip-hop sampling and is a brilliant record. So you've put all this stuff together, you go and find the tapes, you see what's what tapes were available. Some of the tapes were lost. Some of the tapes may have been damaged because they're in the era when the classic Ampex tape was falling apart and would need baked so you could play it through the tape heads. If you can't find the tape, you have to go and find a very clean copy of the record and make a new master from that record. Um, and at that point, you see what order should this go in? How does it how does it sit? How does it listen? How does it play back to the person who wants to buy it? You then have to go and put the package together. In this case, we were lucky. We came up with um, these incredible photos um, made, of, which were taken in the 1980s. In this case, we had these incredible pictures from Jamal Shabazz taken in the 1980s New York um, with three likely looking lads with their Puma States looking dead cool on the subway. What many of us now think of as that era of, um, of New York and that era of hip hop. Um, they look as if they could be break dancers. They possibly were. Um, you gather together images of uh, promotional shots that were taken at the time for the acts. You look for images of uh, the lab record labels and you put it together and hopefully you create a fantastic package. We think we have here.